Well, today we're going to close out our series of messages entitled, So You See, uh, with a message entitled, Inspiring Courage. So if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles or your Bible apps to Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, and just kind of hold that in readiness. Uh, we'll be making reference to it throughout. Now, every effective leader must have the courage to cope with opposition. Uh, parents have to have the courage to deal with the temper tantrums and, and the pouting spells of their children. Otherwise, the, the children will have run of the house. The school teacher who dares to challenge students has to have the courage to endure criticism from the students or maybe their parents for demanding too much. A businessman who wants to lead the company to be the very best that it can be will be opposed by those who don't share the vision or those who become jealous. Uh, the preacher who lacks courage to take a stand on controversial issues so that nobody gets upset winds up being without any moral authority. And even the most effective political leaders are those who courageously take a stand on the issues, rise above the critics, and in the end, we call them statesmen. Jesus said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how the fathers treated the false prophets. In other words, if everybody speaks well of you all the time, it's an indication that you're compromising the truth or you're cowardly caving into peer pressure. Bottom line, a good leader knows you can't please everyone and stand for truth at the same time. You know, I, I saw a cartoon comic years ago with various scenes in, it, in, in this comic. Uh, it's a grandfather lovingly placing his grandson on a donkey and, and they're headed for town. But he overheard somebody say, look at that selfish little boy making that poor old man walk. So he got on the donkey and he made the boy walk. And then he heard, look at that mean old man making that poor child walk. So he got off and walked with his grandson until he heard somebody say, look at those two stupid people. They've got a donkey and they're not even using it. So they both got off the donkey and rode. And then they heard somebody say, look at those cruel people. They're going to break that donkey down. Look, they're abusing that animal. So the last scene, the grandfather and the grandson are carrying the donkey into town. You know what? You just can't please all the people, right? That's just a fact of life. And anybody who feels called to lead from a grandparent to a general must have the courage to cope with criticism and deal with antagonists. Well, today we're going to look and see the example of Jesus Christ. Each week we've been looking at the Bible heroes, but today Jesus Christ, the most dynamic leader who ever lived, he was perfect, he's the model of servant leadership, but he was under constant ferocious attack from his critics. So if you haven't already, please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, where I want us to look at the kind of unjustified assaults that Jesus had to endure. And I hope that uh, uh, we'll not only be instructed on how to handle these things, but inspired by observing Christ's courageous response to his critics. So first, uh, let's just get into it. I want you to see, or I want us to see, that Jesus had the courage to celebrate when others were too rigid. Luke 5, 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. So the context is, I mean, kind of what's going on here is this, there's this religious sect in Judaism called the Pharisees who had reduced their faith to a rigid set of rules and regulations. Now, God's word in the Old Testament did require fasting. As I recall, uh, there was only one day, the Day of Atonement, that was required to fast one day a year. So fasting beyond that one day was voluntary at all other times. You know, and a fast was usually associated with deep grief or uh, uh, repentance. Uh, however, the stricter Jews began to equate fasting with being spiritual, okay? And they insisted on rigid schedules for fasting. For instance, they designated every Monday and every Thursday from dawn to dusk as a day of fasting, right? The scripture says one day. They say every Monday, every Thursday from dusk, dawn to dusk. And they made it a big, they made themselves made a big show of it. They would whiten their faces. They would kind of stoop their shoulders and look weak. So everybody would think that they're really spiritual because they're fasting. Okay. Even their prayers were ritualistic. And, and some examples we see here of this tradition is in Acts 3, we read that Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer, three o'clock in the afternoon. Actually, uh, you, prayer times were at noon, 3, and 6 p.m., okay? In Luke 18, we read about a Pharisee going to the temple to pray, and he boasted about himself, and he said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week, and I tithe my income. Now, let me be clear on this. 
even still yet today, fasting, praying, tithing are all good spiritual disciplines. They truly are. But what's going on here is the Pharisees considered these outward expressions as an end-all to spirituality itself, okay? And, and that these disciplines were a sign of just how a spiritual person was. And you know what? There are, there are still some people who try to do the same thing today. Spirituality to them is they go through the same ritual every week. Like, they go through the same prayers. Uh, they repeat the same creeds. They go through the same order of worship without paying much attention. And they feel they've done their duty. Or they'll, they, you might hear them say things like, well, you know, it just didn't seem like Christmas Eve because we didn't. nobody sang, oh, holy night. It didn't seem like easter we didn't go through lent it didn't seem like church day because we didn't repeat the lord's prayer so when jesus and his disciples didn't fast and pray in the same way that had been traditional the pharisees criticized them for their lack of spirituality but jesus courageously responded by challenging them to celebrate his presence look with me at verse 34 chapter 5 jesus answered can you make the guest of the bridegroom fast while he's with them what do you think the answer is no, okay. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. In other words, let's, let's say uh, you, you go to a wedding reception. Anybody ever been to a wedding reception? Okay, yeah, everybody. Okay, so you can relate to this. Uh, what makes a good one? Uh, answer to yourself. Anyway, let's say you go to a wedding and you're kind of hungry. Okay, I mean, because that preacher just drugged that thing out, and, uh, and there's nothing there at the reception to eat or drink when you get there, and you think, surely, you know, but then the father of the bride gets up and says, hey, folks, uh, we decided we'd like to have a different kind of reception today, a spiritual reception, so what we're going to do is we're just going to ask everybody to circle up, and we're going to fast and pray. There's nothing to eat today. We're just going to pray, so if you just make a big circle, let's pray for the bride and groom. Now, when, you're, when, when you're, you leave, what are you going to say? Oh, that, that was so nice, so spiritual. Or are you going to say, that was cheap? <laughs> yeah, you know, there are other times that I could pray for that bride and groom, but I was ready to eat, okay? The Bible says there's a time for everything and a season for everything under the sun. So a wedding is a time to laugh, eat, dance, and rejoice. And see, Jesus said, listen, I'm the bridegroom, and while I'm with my followers, they're going to celebrate. And they're going to be glad. But when I'm gone, and he's talking here about his crucifixion, then they will fast, okay? Jesus' point, when he was present, his disciples weren't soberly fasting and repeating ritualistic prayers. They were eating, laughing, and celebrating the company of the bridegroom. Now, let's just pause there for a second. And understand that God wants more from us than rigid traditions. Uh, he wants a joyous relationship. You know, I was talking... Uh, 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 I guess it's been about 10 days ago uh, to a member of this church. Uh, we were discussing how to explain uh, to a person that's considering becoming a Christian what kind of commitment that is. And we agreed that it's very much like a marriage that in that it's not a one-day event like a marriage ceremony, uh, like you get baptized and then you're good for life. That's not what it is, okay? But rather, it's a lifelong commitment that you must recommit to every day. I mean, we all know and probably have heard stories of married couples who have marriages that are nothing but tradition and ritual. I mean, they may peck each other in the cheek each morning. They may sit together for an evening traditional tableside meal every evening, and they may talk and discuss things that need to be discussed to keep the household running. But it's like that with everything they do. There's no, nothing more. There's no passion. There's, there's just nothing more. It's just what's tradition. And all that may be good tradition, but if there's nothing more than ritualistic tradition, it's not really all that meaningful, is it? And there's got to be more to a marriage than a ritual or it's, it's on shaky ground. Now, the spiritual traditions are okay too. They can be good. They can serve to remind us of the presence of God and move us into a deeper relationship. But God wants more than rote prayers, automatic check off the box, church attendance. You know, oh, did that today. Our ritualistic writing out of a check. He wants more. Do you know what he wants, church family? He wants us right? He wants us. He wants uh, our conversation. He wants us to feel, he wants us to feel his presence. He wants to feel our presence. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with him and a daily fellowship. In fact, in the book of Amos, God said, I despise your religious feast. I can't stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me offerings, I will not accept them. 
Away with the noise of your songs. I'm not even going to listen to the music of your harps. Now, uh, these folks, they're having a worship service. These are God's people having a worship service, and God says, I'm not having any of it. Why? Why would God say that to his people? Because they were going through ritualistic worship while committing spiritual adultery with pagan false gods. Okay, in other words, their bodies were checking off the spiritual box, but their hearts were not there. Their hearts were somewhere else. Now, it takes courage to lead in a celebration because there will always be those who resent it. Remember when the father of the prodigal son rejoiced over the return of his lost son? He said, kill the fatted calf that celebrate my son who is lost is now found. But the older brother comes in from the field and hears the music and the dancing, and he said, what's going on? And one of the servants told him, your younger brother has come back home and your father's celebrating. The Bible says he was angry. And he said to his father, all these years I've kept the rules and you never celebrated with me. There are always rigid people on the fringe, mumbling, complaining, you know, spreading doom and gloom. But good leaders have the courage to be joyful and optimistic, even though there may be a few who just won't join in. You remember when Jesus arrived at the home of Jairus, a man whose daughter was dead. And when I say dead, she was dead, dead. Okay, uh, the place was full of gloom. Mourners were weeping and, and wailing. And Jesus dismissed all the wailers and said, the girl's not dead. She's sleeping. She's asleep. And the Bible says they laughed at him and they ridiculed him for being joyous at a funeral. But Jesus just took a few of his close followers with him into the girl's room and he took the dead girl's little hand and he said, get up, little lamb. And she sat up alive and then he gave her to her parents and they celebrated. Listen, friends, when Jesus comes, really comes, and he will, there's going to be joy and there's going to be laughter and there's going to be hope and love. And honestly, we can have that even today even if we find ourselves at a funeral. Why? Because he conquered death. And because he has, there is life, and that's the ultimate in leadership. He gives life. Secondly, if you're a note taker, I want us to see that Jesus had the courage to introduce change when others were inflexible. Beginning with verse 36, Jesus tells two parables about the necessity of change. He says, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. It doesn't make sense, he's saying, to ruin a new garment, to patch an old one, for not only will the new garment have a big hole in it, but the, one, the, the old one won't match, okay? And, and then when you wash it, the patch will shrink, and you'll rip the old garment too. Second parable, uh, same like, much like the first, but this one's about old wineskins, verse 37. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old's better. See, Jesus... In Jesus' day, wine was stored in leather bottles, so to speak. So if grape juice is poured into an old, stiff, brittle wine skin, when it ferments and the gases expand, it bursts through the leather bottles and the wine's poured out and then the wine skin bottle's ruined as well. So rather than ruin the old wine skin and lose the wine, the new wine was poured into new wine skins that had more flexibility, more elasticity. The point here is Jesus is bringing a new gospel. And it would not fit into the brittle Old Testament forms anymore. It's too powerful. And these people were going to have to be more flexible, more elastic in their thinking. Now, the next section of Scripture kind of illustrates that. In Luke chapter 6, verse 1, it reads, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them together in their hands, and eat the kernels. And some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Notice this all seems to happen on the Sabbath, right? At my house on our property, uh, the neighbors on both sides of us uh, have, uh, before we arrived, because they're like 25 foot tall, they planted arborvitae trees down the property lines, and those things grow, you know, over the years. And so uh, uh, it's my understanding that it's lawful, I believe it is, uh, that I can trim uh, those branches that come onto my side of the property, which I have, okay? So here's, here's what's kind of going on in this passage. The Jews uh, had a law that if grain grew along a public path, it was legal to pick the grain that you could reach from the path as long as you didn't use the sickle on it, okay? And the idea of that law was to help the poor. So the criticism here is not that the disciples are stealing grain from someone else's field. It's that they're taking the grain on the Sabbath and they're eating it. 
Now, in the Old Testament scripture, it, it said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, and on it you are not to do any work. Well, one, pe- one, what one person does for work, the other person might do for pleasure. So the Pharisees did what they do best. They're like, well, we can't let people make that up on their own. We're going to have to elaborate on that, okay? We're going to have to expand that and make it so everybody... So they list a dozen of legalistic rules and regulations about the Sabbath. In other words, for instance, they said, they stipulated that on the Sabbath, you are not to catch a fish. Can you imagine not fishing <laughs> for a whole day? I mean, no fishing, okay? Uh, nor are you to kill an animal, nor were you to make war on the Sabbath. You weren't to lie with your spouse. You weren't to draw water. You weren't to even plan a journey, let alone go on a journey. You're not even allowed to plan one. You were not to cook a meal on the Sabbath. I guess they all ate out restaurants like we do today, right? <laughs> anyway, the practice was anybody who violated these rules that had been written down could be, catch this, stoned to death. Okay, because you're violating something sacred. And by plucking grain and rubbing it between their hands and eating it, the Pharisee standards the disciples were guilty of making a meal on the Sabbath. And the only thing that you were allowed to eat on the Sabbath was what had been prepared the day before. So the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath? Now, there's a story told. It's an old, old story about a preacher years ago on his way to church. One winter Sunday morning, he found that the bridge was out. And so the church was on the other side of the river. So he put on his, he happened to, I don't know, who carries ice skates in their car? This guy did. He had ice skates in his car, so he skated across the river to the church. And when the elders learned that the preacher had skated on the Lord's Day, they were horrified. And so after the service, they had a meeting, and the preacher explained that it was either skate to church or not get to church at all. What a dilemma these leaders had. What would they decide? Well, finally, one man resolved. He asked the preacher, did you enjoy it? <laughs> And the preacher said no, and they decided it was okay, okay? Now, the Pharisees were about that inflexible, okay? But Jesus courageously responded to their legalism about the Sabbath with a history lesson about the need for flexibility in their thinking. And I love his answer. Uh, Look with me at verse 3. Jesus answered them. He said, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, taking the consecrated bread, sacred bread, holy bread, and he ate it. He ate what was lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Now, the brilliant part of Jesus' answer is the use of David, okay, who isn't King David at the time, but he will be. But anyway, remember David was their all-time hero, kind of like Abraham Lincoln is in America. David was to the Israelites, only bigger, okay? So Jesus said to them, do you remember the story when David was fleeing for King Saul? He went into the tabernacle, and he and his men were very hungry, and they ate the consecrated bread. Not allowed to, okay? Now, in the tabernacle, every week, the priest would put out 12 loaves of bread, remembering the 12 tribes of Israel out on the table. It was an offering to God, so it is sacred bread. And you don't trifle with sacred things, or God might turn you into toast, okay? <laughs> and for eating the bread, okay? And only the priest, after a week, after the week was over, only the priest was permitted to eat that sacred bread. But in this time of desperation, David and his men took these sacred loaves, and they ate them, and God did not condemn them for what they did. How do we know? Because they didn't die, right? He didn't condemn them. And Jesus said, well, neither do you condemn David, so why are you condemning me? Now, before we condemn these Pharisees for being too harsh <clears throat> to illustrate and to illustrate Jesus' point, <clears throat> I want to have a little group participation today. Are you still participating? I, we're about 20 minutes in. Are you still participating, church? <laughs> okay, good. So uh, that's a, you, if it doesn't apply, you don't have to. But let's say you're driving a car. Anybody here ever drive a car? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are not playing? Okay, <laughs> okay most of you are playing, so we'll, we'll go with that. Okay, you drive a car. Okay, good. Stay with me. Anyone ever, as you're approaching a traffic light, have the light turn yellow, and you're not quite there yet, okay? And so you step on it, and you go through the yellow light, but as you're going through, you look up, and it turns red. Show of hands, anyone? Wow, but it's, we got more people. You're proud of being sinners. Good. So, okay, so, so what do you do next? Anybody ever do this? Uh, ever, anybody, you look in your rearview mirror and there's a car following you and he comes through the red light too and you breathe a sigh of relief because you know he's guiltier than you. Anyone? 
<laughs> yeah, you praise Jesus. Yeah, okay, so it gets better. Or how about this? Have you ever said, wow, that guy just blew through a red light. People can get killed doing that. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that one, okay, but you know who you are, and so does God. It's spoken like a true Pharisee, right? Uh, anyway, to our point, let's say then a police officer pulls you over, but he lets the guy behind you go free. What are you going to say? You're going to say, why did you stop me and not stop him, right? Yes? How many? Some of you are so compliant, you'll just take your ticket. You won't say anything. But that's, yeah, that's what we'd say. That's what Jesus is saying. That's, the reason, that's how he's reasoning with the Pharisees. He's saying, listen, if you don't find fault with David when he ate the showbread, when that's condemned, why do you find fault with my disciples for eating grain on the Sabbath and when all it's doing is breaking some man-made law? Why? The answer will tell you something, right? Then Jesus made a very courageous statement in verse 5. Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. You excuse David because he's the anointed king. I am God's anointed king. I'm the one who created the Sabbath. I have the authority to do with it as I please, and it's time for you guys to lighten up you know, your treatment on the Sabbath day. It's time for you to have some new wineskins in your thinking. That's what he's basically telling them. Wow, that's courageous truth speaking, right? I am the Lord of the Sabbath, right? Courageous, inspiring leadership. But here's the thing. If you desire to be effective leader, you can expect to be opposed when you change old traditions, okay? I read a story this week about how a new preacher served at a church where every week they repeated the Lord's Prayer. And after a short time, he began to realize that it was just a rote repetition uh, there was really, they, they were doing it without really thinking about it. And so one Sunday morning, he decided he would substitute that with just a pastoral prayer and then a time of quiet prayer for the people. And a couple met him at the door and very irately said, we're not coming back. They took prayer out of the school. Now you're taking prayer out of the church. Now, that, that, right, that seems ridiculous to us, but the truth is there, there's a true principle in there. For if you change traditions, you will get some people upset. Okay, years ago, when we first came to Indiana and served at the Christian Youth Home in Fortville, our youngest daughter, Cassie, started a Bible study in our home for girls her age. And one of the girls sometime later wanted to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior and be baptized in the church. And the girl wanted Cassie to do it. Well, Cassie asked me if that was possible, and I said, well, Scripture doesn't forbid it. In fact, I think it encourages, but uh, we'd be wise to ask the elders of the church and see if it's okay. Well, the elders had to call it a meeting to discuss it and and because it, it had never been done before where a woman uh had done a baptism cassie though a teen you know still fits that mold so i'm sure they realized if they allowed it 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 just might cause a stir well they had their meeting and their conclusion of their meeting they said well if scripture doesn't condemn it and god doesn't condemn it then neither should they and what's more, they thought it the perfect opportunity to reestablish a very important biblical principle, and that is disciples of Christ making disciples of Christ. A middle school student, male or female, baptizing someone they led to Christ was a perfect example to the rest of the body. Now, I don't know that anyone left the church over that. I certainly hope not, but still, that was courageous leadership, right? Jesus' commandment to his disciples was to go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Was that just to preachers? No. Was that just to men? No. We have a great slogan in our movement that says, in doctrine, unity, but in opinion, liberty, and in all things, love. You know, I've heard it said that a legalist is someone who believes that nothing should ever be done for the first time. <laughs> You know, that's what they are. Right? So you see, our minds, our, our minds are kind of, we can be like that. We can be like old, rigid wineskins that lose flexibility and we can't accept new ideas. The truth is, God's word, it, it never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But God's methodology, God's wineskins, they're always changing. Every leader in any field soon learns this simple slogan, it takes guts to leave the ruts. The third thing I want you to notice about Jesus is that Jesus had the courage to confront when others were threatening him. Verse 6 of chapter 6, look with me. 
On another Sabbath, we went into the synagogue and was teaching, and, and, and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason. Listen to this: the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now notice that these Pharisees were beginning to resent Jesus so much that they were now spying on him, okay? I mean, they were carefully watching every move that he made, hoping that he would make a mistake. And it's not easy to live or work in that kind of scrutiny. Now, over the years of ministry, I've had very little of that. I thank God all the time. I'm really grateful for that. Truly, this church has been remarkable They've been good at accepting change and being fairly cooperative when traditions are are changed. But like any church preacher, I've experienced a little bit, okay? Once at the end of a message, this is a couple decades ago, but once at the end of a message when extending an invitation to become a member of the church, I said, if you wish to join the church. And after the service, someone came to me and said, you don't join the church, you join the Lions Club, you join the Rotary Club. In church, we extend the right hand of fellowship. And honestly, I get that. I, I was raised with that. I, I know where that came from. I don't know that it makes any eternal difference, the wording, but I got it. And I didn't really mind because that person that was doing it, it was really good people, okay? And they were probably just having a bad day, so, you know, no big deal. But that's sometimes how people can get out of sorts and scrutinize, hoping they can find some little thing. It really takes courage and grace to respond in an appropriate manner when accusations are unfair and they come your way. Now, the Pharisees knew, they knew that Jesus' custom was to go to the synagogue, and they knew that this particular synagogue, in it, there was this man with a shriveled hand. Some scholars go so far as to say they maybe planted him there, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. I probably think not, but I guarantee you they knew, okay? And they were hoping, they were hoping they were hoping maybe Jesus would heal that man and he'd have use of that hand from this point on. Is that what they're hoping? That he'll make this man better? Is that No, that's not. No, they were hoping. This is so bad. I mean, doesn't a good person hope for healing for healing's sake? You know, not these guys. They hope he tries to heal on the Sabbath day. So we can point out that he's violated the law that physicians can't work on the Sabbath. But Jesus courageously disregarded the consequences and he confronted them openly. He runs right at them. Verse 8, it says, Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man, the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he stood up. He got up and stood, stood there. Now, the Lord's compassionate heart, I mean, he could have waited until after the service was over, he could have healed the man privately, you know. But I, I want us to see that he deliberately confronted the matter head on. And in verse 9, Jesus said to the others, he tells the man, stand up. And he does. Now to the others, he says, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? And the answer is to do good or to save life or to destroy it, which is, which is better. To save life, yeah. I, I mean, the answer is obvious. I remember when Southeast Christian Church, because uh, this goes back a couple of decades, because they, they had a need for more services. Uh, if you don't know Southeast, it's in Louisville. It's kind of the flagship church of our brotherhood. You know, it used to be 20-some thousand now with, with uh, uh, branch churches. They have even more. But uh, this was many years ago when churches first started adding on to their services with a Saturday night service. It's been quite a while ago. Lots of churches do it now. But Bob Russell, who was the senior minister way back then, said after, after they did that, once in a while, he'd have a legalistic brother ask him, where do you have the authorization to have church on Saturday night? And he would say, I get it in the same passage. You get the one where it says you can have church on Wednesday night. And he said, they'd say, well, you know what we mean. Uh, and Bob said they quote to him Acts 27, which says the early church met on the first day of the week and they had communion. And you're having people worship on Saturday night and they have communion. Where do you get the biblical authorization for that? And Bob said he would say Acts 20 also says Paul preached until midnight. Where do you have the authorization to quit preaching so early? I think we need to get biblical around here. <laughs> Start packing a lunch, you know. And, uh, but Bob said he would say, you see, Jesus instituted communion on a Thursday right and and he said as often as you do this do it in remembrance of me the emphasis was not on what day it was on remembrance okay and and jesus said to these pharisees now the early church did practice it on you can practice it on any day okay jesus said to these pharisees it is lawful to do evil 
or, and not good on the Sabbath? No, you, you want to do good. Romans 14, 5 says clearly, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should fully be convinced in his own mind. Colossians 2 says, don't let anybody judge you with regard to a Sabbath day. You know who wrote those passages? A couple of them there. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's God's word. And who and why does he write them? Because the brethren are arguing about traditions and rituals, each according to their own preference. So what's Jesus to do? What's Jesus to do about this man with the withered hand, What with his critics looking on? Well, look at verse 10. We see Jesus looked around at them all, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, which is kind of cool because have you ever noticed like how many times Jesus asked somebody that he's going to heal to display an expression of faith uh, to a crippled man he he would say would you take up your bed and walk well he's crippled he said take up your bed and walk to this man with a shriveled hand he said would you stretch out your hand and when he did so his hand was completely restored now the reason jesus confronted this openly is that he wanted to illustrate i believe that caring for people was more important than keeping petty roles man-made roles okay not god's roles man-made roles i mean we're not talking about God's roles. We're talking about man-made roles that were initially, I'm sure they were made up for the benefit of the people. They had good intentions, but it's not long when you start making roles like that in any organization before roles provide a sense of security and power for those that enforce them. And the roles take precedent then, or can, over the people. I read a story this week about a, a former governor named John Brown, and it seems he was driving a car, uh, felt he was having a heart attack, okay? And so he pulled into a hospital, walked into the emergency room, and said, I believe I'm having a heart attack. And the receptionist said, sir, you're going to have to move your car. It's in a no parking zone. He said, but I think I'm having a heart attack. And she said, and we'll talk about that just as soon as you move your car. I, I, I you know, I want to say a word. To those who volunteer at this church, and, and uh, if you haven't already, we're collecting those volunteer forms today. I think today's the last day, but, you know, we'll take them forever. And, uh, uh, but if you haven't had a chance, fill those out. But listen, we are truly thankful uh, for those willing to serve and, and give. And, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's the secret to building joy in your own life, and it's the secret to building a life of joy within the church volunteering and serving one another and we're especially thankful and appreciative for those that have been volunteering for a long time for you're the backbone of the church okay but all of us all of us the staff included elders included all of us need to remember that we're here to not only share the truth but to share grace okay and that we're here to help and to heal and not just to enforce rules like any organization we have some guidelines and we have some policies but none of us are here to enforce guidelines and policies first we're here to welcome serve and love people to be kind to people smile at people explain to people and sometimes even make concessions to people truth is we're here to connect people to jesus one person at a time now i will confess to you this can be a weak area for me one of my pet peeves is people who look perfectly healthy parking in disabled spots I don't know anybody else have a, it just bugs me, okay? I mean, sometimes we need a couple of grocery store items from the grocery store, and we shop a lot at Kroger, and, and so instead of parking, and Margie and I both going in, you know, I'll just drop her off at the storefront, and then I wait in the parking lot until she finishes, then I drive up and pick her up. And sometimes while I'm waiting, I'll see some young person with one of those disabled signs or plates, you know, in the vehicle park in a disabled spot, and they get out, and they literally run into the store, and I want to roll down my window and scream, hey, buddy, you don't look like you're disabled to me. What are you doing taking a spot meant for people who really need it? And I, and, and I want to tell them, I can clearly see you because I'm parked over here in the click it parking spot. <laughs> you know, so I can see you, you know. That, that's actually how I got convicted that this was wrong, okay? I'm like, well, you're doing the same thing. You're in the click it spot so you can see Margaret come out. Okay, so yes, I have done that. But usually I park now out, way out in the parking lot for a period of time, and then I just circle the lot by the front door until she comes out. And when I do see a person that looks questionable parking at a disabled spot, I try to remember I don't know their story, you know, and I try to extend grace. But the point is, while we do our best to walk in truth, we need to do good by extending grace to those who really may just need it. Jesus tried to underscore that openly. In verse 11, we read, when Jesus confronted the Pharisees with this principle, they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, 
you all know what they're going to do to Jesus, right? Church? Yeah. They're going to kill him, right? They're going to unjustly judge him. They're going to unjustly torture him. They're going to unjustly crucify him on a cross. And this event that we're looking at today is just the beginning. Listen, friends, you want to see courage, inspiring courage? You, you look at the cross, where Jesus voluntarily, courageously, even joyfully endured the torture and pain for us. And he says to us, his disciples, now, if you're going to follow me, then you need to take up your cross daily and follow me. And that takes courage. But he's the only one who can lead us into forgiveness of sins, and it's only through him that we can have eternal life. And all of God's people said, let's pray that it might be so. Father, we, we give thanks this day for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our perfect example, the perfecter of our faith. And uh, Lord, we, we understand now looking that Jesus was courageous all the way to the cross. And uh, he had a heart of compassion, a heart of love, a heart for the people. But when faced with inflexibility or faced with someone who was going to confront him, he, he stood on truth. He was full of truth and he was full of grace. And Lord, we pray that as we prepare to leave this place that uh, we would allow the Spirit to lead us in a way that we would be people that are full of grace and full of truth as we witness and, and live in a world that needs truth and grace. We pray it might be so that it would bring glory to Jesus and advance his kingdom. It's in his name. Amen.